A key point about radioactive decay is it's random. We can never predict when an individual radioactive nucleus will decay. Radioactive decay is random. That means it only depends on the nucleus. It cannot be influenced by external factors. This video I'm going to tell you everything you need to know to master the topic of half-life in radioactive decay. You see, because radioactive decay is random, it means we cannot predict when an individual radioactive isotope will decay. We cannot predict when one nucleus is going to decay. What we do know is that there's a probability of any individual radioactive isotope decaying at any given time, just like rolling a dice and getting a six. We can't predict when we get a six, but we do know there's a probability each time we roll the dice of getting a six. So using dice is a good model for radioactive decay. This is Guerrilla Physics and other channels where they teach you the content, but I'm gonna show you how to get a grade nine. We know that radioactive decay is random, so we can't predict when an individual nucleus will decay, and then we can't use any external factors to influence when that decay will happen. But what we do know is that there's a certain probability that any individual nuclei will decay in any given second. So just like rolling a dice, we know there's a probability of getting a certain number. So with very large numbers of nuclei, and in any given sample there are large numbers of nuclei, with any large numbers of nuclei, it's always going to follow a really set pattern, because we know that it's all governed by probabilities. And therefore we can model it with dice, and I'm going to use dice in this video to actually model half-life. You can run a model yourself, you can run this FET simulation yourself, and there's another model coming up later that you could try out for yourself as well. I'll put a link in the description for this, but I'm not going to show this one today. But this is a really useful way to explore the idea for yourself. Let's define what we mean by half-life, because a really simple question at GCSE could just ask you to define it. It's the average time taken for the number of nuclei to half. And this is most commonly shown on a graph like the one we have here. This graph shows activity against time, and you can see it has this curve. Now that curve is actually an exponential curve, which you don't need to really describe in those terms in GCSE, but it's a useful thing to know later. It's not the same thing as an inverse proportionality. And what it means is that in any given time, then there's an equal fraction chain. So we use the fraction half to measure how long different isotopes are going to be radioactive for. They all have different half-lives. They all have different times taken for half the number of radioactive nuclei to decay. The most common question on half-lives that you'll get given is you'll be given a graph like this and you'll have to actually use it to get the half-life from it. This is real data for a radioactive isotope called protactinium. So can you read off the half-life? Pause the video now and see if you can actually get the half-life from this. So as I said, this is the most common question and all you need to do is you need to just half the number at the start, whatever the y-intercept is, you need to just half it. So I've got 250 counts per minute at the start, half of 250 is 125, go across to the line of the data and then down to the x-axis and read off whatever value that is. So that value is somewhere in the region about 77, 78, something like that. So strictly speaking, because it's the average time taken for the number of nuclei to half, you should probably do a second one. So half of 125 again, across to the line and then down to the x-axis. Read this value off here and then actually the 153, that was two half-lives, so half that gives you 77.5 seconds as being the half-life of protactinium, and that's not far off, that's pretty much what it is. And make sure that you show your interpolation on your graph, because even if you read off inaccurately, then you will still get a mark for having shown that you know how to use the skill of interpolation in your exam. So that's actually from real data, but we can use a model, and I'm going to use a model called All the Dice, I like to call this one All the Dice, and you perhaps we'll do this in class at some point, but you essentially need a large number of dice and you need a simple table like this, and you're going to roll all of those dice at once, and we normally use this by shaking a tray or tipping it into another tray, and you're going to actually count how many come out every single time and therefore record a number of dice left. You need to go for about 15 turns of this, and what I'm doing here in this clip is I'm actually stacking each turn how many dice have come out. So you're getting a kind of visual representation of the number that have decayed each turn. In this case, the turn number is our measurement of time. So we aren't actually running a stopwatch because it doesn't matter really how long this goes on for, but we're saying turn number is representing time in our model. So our half-life is gonna come out in 
turns. Radioactive Decay is completely random and actually I really like that this model is giving me some funny results at, at times and actually I'm going to repeat this model a few times and get a larger number, a larger sample size. I have a hundred dice in this model but I'm going to do this several times to get a larger sample size to hopefully get closer to an accurate trend. So I have a hundred dice here. I have a hundred dice in this bag and I have two trays. I'm going to build a half-life graph on this bit of paper here and I'm going to show you hopefully that the activity is the same as the number of dice there for it follows the same pattern. The number that decay in any one turn changes proportionally with the number that there actually are. none for this last one. So it's a really important thing to see that actually this decay is completely random. It does not look like the pattern I expected at the start but overall hopefully you can see that half-life decay curve just there. So here's some data and you could actually use this example if you wish and you could plot this graph. So pause the video now if you've got some graph paper or just some squared paper or you could try and do this on Excel actually plot this graph. So this is real data with 200 dice and you can see I've got that exact same trend that I was expecting. I'm just going to draw a line of best fit. Here's my pro tip for lines of best fit. If you angle them around such that your arm actually turns and twists in the same direction as the line you're trying to draw, then it's much easier to draw that accurately. And then just do a couple of practice swings and try and just go through the majority of the data. I feel like I've not done the best job towards the end here. I don't mind just rubbing out a little part of it. But it doesn't have to go through all of the points. There we go, that's pretty good. And now I'm going to use that graph to actually work out a half-life for these dice. So exactly the same effort every single time, whatever the value that it cuts the y-axis at the start, whatever the starting value, whatever the line cuts the y-axis at the start, half that number gives me 100. That is not the half-life, as some people mistakenly think it is. Do a line across to the line of best fit, not to the points, but to the line of best fit. And then down to the x-axis. And that value there, that is the half-life. It should come out exactly on four because by the law of probability, then it sh that should be the value for a probability of one sixth, which is what I was using in this case. I was taking each dice out when they scored a six, so they decayed whenever they had a six. So that is the probability for this one. But it doesn't quite get to exactly turn four, and that's okay because half-life is random because radius decay is random. But if I do it again for a second time, I should find I get closer to that value. So half of 100 is 50. Yeah, that is turn number eight. So that is the second half-life, if you like. So on average, I've got eight divided by two, which gives me four turns is the half-life. So this slide is just to show you that it should be exactly the same half-life whether you're using a graph of number of undecayed nuclei or number of undecayed dice in this case or the actual activity, the decayed dice each turn. 
So the activity is how many radioactive particles, how many decays there are per second, or in this case, how many decays there are per turn. Although the numbers are different, you can see in the table, the numbers are different. The numbers are a lot lower for the decay. They are following the same trend if you look at the two graphs. So actually the half-life should come out exactly the same, whether we're dealing with number of atoms or number of nuclei, or whether we're dealing with activity or the rate of decay of those dice. For both of these graphs, we have a half-life of four turns. So whatever type of graph they give you, all you need to remember to do is do half the y-axis and then read off the time using interpolation. That's what it's called when we're moving from one axis to another, it's called interpolating. Interpolate means between the poles or between the axes of the graph. These are refutation texts. These are commonly held misconceptions about Half-Life. So what I want you to do now is pause the video and actually think, well, how would you finish these off? These are all things that some people have got wrong. Pause the video now, have a think how you'd finish these sentences and then unpause them. Okay, hopefully you had a go at that. So some people think the Half-Life is just half the number of nuclei. However, it's at the average time taken for the number of nuclei or the activity to half. So just remember, the half-life is a measurement of the time taken for something to half, time. Some people think that if it takes 5,700 years for one half-life, then after 11,400 years, all of the nuclei will be gone. And this is a really key misconception that I marked loads and loads and loads of last year. And I found that loads of people thought if it took a certain amount of time for a half-life, then double that was the full life, they kept writing. Half was gone in the first half-life and then the next half as in whatever was left over was gone in the second half-life so that would be like the full life so it was a bit of a misconception not really understanding that it just keeps halving and halving and halving some people would think it takes a certain amount of time for one half-life and then to two half-lives, all of the nuclei be gone. But actually after an, another 5,700 years, after another half-life, then it, the number halves again. So there'd be a quarter left. So after two half-lives, there's a quarter of what there was at the very beginning. Some people think that a short half-life makes something much more dangerous. However, although it might be more active, a short half-life does mean that some, a sample is more active. It gives out more radiations per second. It's going to be active for a shorter amount of time. And actually something with a longer half-life that you had much more of would still give out more radiations per second. It just wouldn't be decaying as fast. So actually things with short half-lives are in a way a bit more safe because they'll be gone quicker. But that's not a hard and fast rule. Just like the penetration and ionization power, you have to think about these things together. You can't just think about half-life on its own. If you've got an actual larger sample of something with a long half-life, then that could be way more dangerous. It could be giving out more radiations per second. So we use radioactive materials for lots and lots of really useful purposes. And one thing you need to do when you select a isotope to use is decide whether you want it to be a long half-life or a short half-life. Here are five different uses of radioactive isotopes. I want you to pause the video now and I want you to work out whether you think you'd pick something with a long half-life or something with a short half-life for that purpose. And a challenge is to actually think, well, how long would you need it to be roughly? Isn't there? There's no kind of perfectly right answer, but just think days, years, months, or hours, what would you pick? So for a radioactive source in a school, you would like quite a long half-life, somewhere in the region of 30 years, you know, something around that. As long as it's long enough to like last for a good number of years, it's worth having. It wouldn't be worth having something with such a short half-life that you open the cupboard and it wasn't radioactive anymore. Most radioactive sources in schools have a half-life of about 30 years. Some of them though have half-lives of about five years and uh, loads of radioactive sources in schools haven't been replaced for a long, long time. For example, Cobalt 60 has a half-life of five years and it... <laughs> And most cobalt 60 sources in schools are basically not radioactive anymore because they've been sitting in the cupboard for about 50 years. So they've actually halved 10 times over the time in which they've been sat in the cupboard, hardly being used. And now they're not worth using. <laughs> so for fuel for a nuclear power station, uranium, would you want a long or a short half-life? Probably a long half-life, uh, you know, at least 30 years or above. And that's because you want a nuclear power station to have enough fuel to last its lifetime. And a nuclear power station should last for about 60 years, really. The lifespan of a nuclear power station is going to be about that. So you want it to be longer than 30 years so that it's not completely spent and completely not radioactive after a really short amount of time. 
A radioactive tracer for finding a leak in a pipe though, you'd want that to be a short half-life because you just want to find that leak and then you want it to stop being radioactive quickly so you can carry on using that piece of machinery or whatever pipe you're looking at. Now a beta source for measuring the thickness of paper, you'd want that to be a long half-life because again you don't want to have to keep replacing the radioactive material, it's hazardous so you want to be able to put it in the machine, leave it there and expect it to still be working the same in 10, 20, 30 years time, so you want it to be a long half-life. Now a medical radioactive tracer, that means you inject somebody and you're actually looking for those gamma rays outside their body, you want that to be a short half-life but not so short that you don't even have time to measure it. So you want it to be less than 24 hours because you don't want to be sending that person home radioactive in a few days. You want to do the scan as quickly as possible and have them safe, have them no longer being irradiated after quite a short period of time. There's a video here where I measure the half-life for a bottle of water and this is a really good challenge if you wanted to try and measure the half-life of something at home and obviously you can't get a half-life of an actual radioactive isotope uh, and maybe you don't have all of the dice at home and you're not going to order a hundred dice from Amazon like I did uh, but you could use a two litre or any bottle of water really and you just drill a hole in the bottom and you can measure its height as it actually decreases and because the pressure changes you get a graph which is pretty similar to the half-life graph. So here's an example calculation. Radioactive tracers can be used to find leaks in pipes underground and isotopes with short half-lives are used, we've covered that. Sodium-24 has a half-life of 15 hours. A small sample is inserted into a water pipe. Initially, it has an activity of 200 becquerel. You don't need to worry too much about BQ becquerel, that just means per second. So it's gonna give out 200 radiations per second. Calculate the activity of the tracer after five days. So whenever you're doing this type of question, your first job is to figure out how many many half-lives have passed. So just take, we've got five days, so that's 120 hours. Divide that by 15, which is the half-life, and you can see therefore eight half-lives have passed. So all you need to think about is how long have you left it, how many half-lives have passed. You do that by counting, 15 hours, 30 hours, 45 hours, and so on, and you get eight when you got to 120 hours. And then you need to take your starting activity and you need to divide it by two eight times. 0.78. Now that's a little bit long and likely to mean that you make mistakes. So I have a shortcut, but that is essentially the idea of calculating with a half-life. Work out how many half-lives you have and then divide it by two that number of times. Half it that number of times. So at the end of those five days, there is going to be an activity of 0.78 becquerels. 0.78 radiations per second so after five days that water is basically not radioactive we don't want our water supply to be radioactive now i have a shortcut which has got a little bit more maths in it a little bit harder to follow maybe but it is shorter so a lot of the times in physics it's worth noting these shortcuts are kind of higher order math skills do you want to do the long and easy way or the short but harder way so this is the short but harder way firstly it works out exactly the same idea to begin with how long have you actually left it for? 120 hours. 120 divided by 15 gives you eight half-lives because the half-life is 15 hours. Eight half-lives have passed. So what you need to do is divide 200 by two eight times. And that is the same as saying 200 divided by two to the power of eight. So this is a really neat way to write half of 200 eight times. 200 divided by two to the power of however many half-lives there are, in this case eight, gives you 0.78 becquerel. So that's a really useful, really straightforward way actually of using the maths to, to simplify this. There's a really useful idea of net decline. Net decline is a really useful idea where we don't deal with actual numbers of radioactive nuclei. We actually just say, what fraction of radioactive nuclei have we got left after any given time? If one half-life has passed, you've got a half. If two half-lives have passed, you've got a quarter. Three half-lives, you've got an eighth, four, a sixteenth, and so on. That's one over two to the power of the number of half-lives that have passed. That's the net decline. But I really wanted you to get that idea. For any calculation, you need to work out how many half-lives have passed, and you need to half it that number of times. Thank you.
here's another simulation that I'm not going to actually do right now, but you can. I'll put the link in the description and you can have a little go of this. Radiocarbon dating is a really useful thing. It's a way we can work out how old fossils are or how old any dead living material is. It's an excellent application of half-life and it's one that comes up loads. Okay, well basically it works like this. There's a fixed ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 in the atmosphere. And that's because carbon-14 is made in the atmosphere by decaying nitrogen-14. So nitrogen-14 actually turns into carbon-14 when it's hit by a cosmic ray from outer space. But basically there's a fixed ratio, okay, the fixed proportion of carbon-14 to carbon-12 naturally present in the atmosphere. And all living things therefore have the same ratio of carbon. We're mostly made out of carbon that we get from plants and plants have taken that carbon in from the atmosphere by doing photosynthesis. So they've taken in the same ratio of carbon 14 to carbon 12 as there is in the atmosphere so if we're alive we've been eating things that are alive or have been alive recently therefore everything that's alive has this same ratio when something dies it stops taking in any more carbon 14 so that ratio begins to change because carbon 14 is radioactive and it decays so the ratio of carbon 14 to carbon 12 reduces over time so you get less carbon 14 as time goes on we can then use the half-life of carbon 14 to to actually work out how long ago the organism died. And that's an explanation that you could just memorize for if that came up in an exam. So here are three questions to check you've understood what we've covered in this video so far. Pause the video now and give them a go. Firstly, define a half-life. So what's a half-life? It's the average time taken for a number of nuclei or for the activity to half. It's the time taken for something to half. State the proportion of nuclei left over after one half-life has passed. So one half-life of time has passed, so there's half left. Now that is just a kind of ratio, that is a proportion that is left. If we started with one, we've ended up with half. If we started with 100, we've ended up with 50 after the first half-life. State the proportion of nuclei that's left after four half-lives have passed. So after one half-life, you've got half. After two half-lives, you've got a quarter. After three half-lives, you've got an eighth. So after four half-lives, you've got sixteenth, a sixteenth of what you start. So here's a legitimately hard question they could ask you about half-lives and it just doesn't appear to be as simple but it is actually quite straightforward it's just about being resilient when it comes to numbers like they've given you in this they've not just given you standard form but they've also given you numbers that are within ratios so let's just work through this one together I'm sure you can manage it so pause the video now if you're feeling confident if not then what I suggest you do is actually to watch for a bit until you think you get the idea then pause and then try for yourself or try it a little bit unpause for a bit when you get stuck and then when you feel like you're ready to go again pause it again and have a go but do as much of this as you can for yourself because that's the best way to learn just watching me go through stuff isn't going to really make it sink in Let's just decode what we've got to do first of all radiocarbon dating uses the ratio of carbon 14 to carbon 12 in samples of fossils or dead organic matter to calculate the rage that's just information so far they haven't told me to do anything they haven't really given me any useful information apart from maybe the fact that carbon 14 is the radioactive one so that's just information and that's just context they haven't really given me anything useful to use so far and they haven't given me any instructions either carbon 12 is made in the atmosphere by cosmic rays interacting with nitrogen 14 okay um, again that's just information that's not useful so far this occurs at a fixed rate because the ratio of carbon 12 to carbon 14 is fixed in the atmosphere so it is fixed in all living matter again this is just information however this ratio so this is the fixed ratio this is like the starting ratio if you like is one that's carbon 12 to 1.3 times 10 to the minus 12. So this is our fixed ratio in all living things. So this is our kind of starting number, our starting value for how much carbon 14 there is in, in a living thing. A fossil is found containing a ratio of 1 to 8.1 times 10 to the minus 14. Now let's just get our head straight around this. This is a lower number and this is the fossil. So this is what's kind of left, if you like, after a certain period of time. So we have this number at the start and this number at the end. And we can just ignore the one because both these ratios are just the fixed numbers of carbon 12 to whatever carbon 14 there is. You see there's a lot less carbon 14 than carbon 12 in any given sample. But the only numbers that we're actually interesting, interested in is the standard form bit. The half-life of radioactive carbon 14 is 5,700 years. You need to calculate the age of the sample. All you need to do is calculate the age of the sample and we've been given the half-life here. So let's first of all work out how many half-lives have passed. 
So this was our starting value and this was our ending value. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to do 1.3 times 10 to the minus 12 and I'm going to divide that by 8.1 times 10 to the minus 14. It's 16.1, okay, so I'm just gonna call that 16. I'm gonna call that 16 to two significant figures. So there's 16, this value is 16 times larger than this one. So I have 1 16th left. So how many half-lifes is that? So I have 1 16th left over from what I started with. So the first half-life I would have had a half, the second half-life I'd had a quarter, the third half-life I would have had an eighth, and the fourth half-life I would have had a 16th. So how many half-lifes have passed? That means, therefore, four half-lifes have passed. So what is the half-life? How long does it take for the number to half? It's 5,700. So the time is four times 5,700 years. So this fossil is 22,800 years old. I hope that makes sense. That's a bit tricky. It's just a bit tricky though because of the way they've presented the values to us. So for all these half-life questions, you really just need to get the idea that you are working out how many half-lifes have passed, either because you've been given a time that's passed or because you've been given some ratio of however many you've got left. Work out how many half-lifes have passed and from that work to a time or work out how many you've got left. And if you've got a graph, then you simply half whatever that value is on the y-axis and you read off the time taken for that value to half. I hope that was useful. If it was, then hit the subscribe button.